I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I welcome you into this worship service. I am so glad you have chosen to be in this house of the Lord this morning. And I pray that this worship experience will be a blessing for each one of you. The announcements, well, we do have a birthday this, we have a birthday today. Peggy Googe is celebrating, and she's not here, but Peggy is celebrating her birthday today. We are having a worship ministry team meeting immediately following worship back in the fellowship hall. We have updated directories. So if they're out on that table in the narthex, pick one up. And like Cora said, throw the other updated directory away. And we will have them out there as long as you need them. We will print more copies this week. So if you don't know what they look like, you do now. It looks a lot like that. That's what it looks like. Hey. <laughs> you, know, you know it's going to be a good day when. Okay, mats for the homelets every Monday at 3 o'clock. We make them down in the basement. We don't. They do. <laughs> but intercessory prayer here in the sanctuary Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And the Ruth Circle of Cumberland Presbyterian Women's Ministry is meeting Thursday at 1030. And speaking... Sack lunch, bring your lunch, and you will enjoy it together. <laughs> yeah, if you're ever up here on Monday when they're down there working with the mats, they are quite, quite, yeah, wild and crazy. Yeah, I'm afraid to go down there. It's scary. It's way too much fun for me. But speaking, the segue is, speaking of Cullen Presbyterian Women's Ministry, and I will not allow her to stand anywhere close to the pulpit. She <laughs> stole my sermon Only because I steal notes. his sermons and pass them out <laughs> and leave him blank. Uh, so this Saturday, we have a great opportunity to participate in a denominational online retreat for ladies. So it starts at 10 o'clock our time, 9 o'clock central time, and we will have uh, a watch party here for those ladies that are interested. If you could let me know, you could say something to me today, you could email me, you could text me. My information's in the updated directory. <laughs> However you need to get a hold of me, maybe by Thursday, if you plan on attending in person, and if you plan on going out to eat with us later, or we may bring in something, what everybody wants to do. That way we can plan appropriately for spacing and, and fun times. So Reverend Lisa Scott will be the speaker, and then we'll have some small group sharing, and then we will participate in a global communion event. That's another reason we would love to know exactly how many people might be in person uh, on Saturday. So I've never participated in a hybrid on online retreat like this, so I'm excited to see what our denomination has and a chance to fellowship with you guys in person, or if you'd rather be at home in your PJs, you can uh, get the link, and I'll be glad to share that with you as well. And just as a side note, the Tennessee-Alabama game does not start until later that evening, <laughs> if that would be a barrier. <laughs> you no, know, okay. that's scary. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Whoa, I missed it. Page Turners meeting this afternoon between 1 and 1.15, back in the fellowship hall. Yeah, Founders Hall, where we have fellowship. Are there any other, any, did I miss anything else? Meg, oh, there are calendars, 2022 calendars. And we have several out there. Thank you, several. Did you, you, if you get there quick, you can have your pick of different styles of calendars. They are out there. What, what else did I miss? Do I have time for a sermon later? No. Yeah, timer, I'm going to do it anyway. If there are no other announcements, then let us worship God.
call to worship is taken from the 15th chapter of John, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we gather this morning to be connected once again to your life-giving presence. We, we want to drink from the fountain of life and be fed by the bread of heaven so we can bear much fruit. Lord, we know. We know that apart from you, we can do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. Fill our cup, Lord. Come and quench the thirsting of our soul. Feed us till we want no more. Fill us up and make us whole. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 10, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. be seated while the children come forward for their special time. Hey guys, come on down. Absolutely. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You want to do a fist pump? Your, your brother? Not today. That's all right. How are y'all? Good. What do I have in my bag here? Sand. You want to give it a little squeeze? It feels neat, doesn't it? Well, your sand. A little kinetic sand. Give it a little squeeze there. And that feels neat, doesn't it? You want to squeeze it? Not today. All right. Uh, last week I went to the beach and I put my toes in the sand and it was nice. Have y'all, anybody made it to the beach yet in the past couple of years? Awesome. So you know how sand feels underneath your toes. Did uh, anybody ha see anybody make any sand castles or did y'all make any sand castles? Gotcha. You didn't see it. Well, you know, some people are really talented that they can take something very ordinary like sand, which was is everywhere on the beach, and create something very beautiful with it. And some of y'all may... And sand, yeah, and, and so, and shells, that's right, it's a little uh, breaking down thing and put shells on it, make it all real pretty, and you know, it's kind of like a talent. Have you ever heard of somebody said, you're so talented, you're so good, you got a gift. You know, it just means that you're really good at something. And some people, I got a couple of pictures to show, 
And here are some pictures of some design in the sand. I like that, don't you, the seahorse? Okay, we got that one, and then we got a 3D one. Okay, looks like, uh, what's his face went to uh, the sand? What's that, o Olaf? Yeah, or Frosty, yes. Okay, we got one more. Look how, this is all made out of sand. Uh, that's right, it's a bee. And then the last one is a castle. Do you think you could do that? Look, you got even uh, Winnie the Pooh and looks like a Tigger and, and all sorts of things. So something ordinary can become extraordinary. Now, you know, God has given us talents and gifts in our life. And uh, as we God gives us these gifts, and when we give them back to him, he helps us to do extraordinary things for his glory. And so uh, we have different gifts throughout our lives. So you have, you have gifts right now that you can use to uh, glorify God. Now, some people, you know, when you think of gifts, what do you think of? Someone who can do something really well. Singing, painting, and the wonderful things. And you also can have a gift of or playing. Yeah, absolutely. Ball. I was going to show a video of a guy that's really good with Frisbee. And you need to look him up. He's pretty cool. He could do some pretty sweet tricks with a Frisbee. He's pretty talented. An ordinary plastic thing. And he can do uh, pretty extraordinary things with it. But, you know, some people have a gift to talking to others. Listening is a gift. It's hard to do, listening, you know, making somebody feel welcome, you know, bringing people together, leading. Those are all gifts. And God gives you all these gifts, and we need to use it for him. And there's a passage in the story that we're going to learn about today about God giving different talents. And uh, one thing he doesn't want us to do with our talent is hide it. So don't ever think your gift is not good enough or not uh, skilled enough. You do your gifts, and you do your gifts now. Because if you look in the Bible, you know, Moses, who was living on the backside of the desert as a failed prince of Egypt, came back with God's help and delivered his nation. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. And you keep practicing. You keep practicing your talent and you get better and better and you ask God for help. And, you know, uh, Mary, who was just an ordinary teenager, God, her and she was the mother of the Messiah. Ordinary people do, doing extraordinary things. Simon Peter was would have lived and died as an ordinary fisherman, but God called him to be the church, the foundation. Okay, so God can make ordinary talent extraordinary if we give Him the glory, and it furthers His kingdom. So let's pray. Let's everybody stand up. Okay, bless you. Thank you, dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for my talents. Help me honor you. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 367. Fill my cup, Lord.
may be seated. May we hear Jesus say to each one of us, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Let us worship now with the giving of our gifts to God. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for blessing us with, with small opportunities and responsibilities. Our desire is, is to always give you our best. We pray that everything we do brings glory to you. We're excited to, to see the new opportunities and responsibilities with which you will bless us. May we never shy away or feel fearful of taking the next steps that we need to take in order to serve you and to serve your people. Our heart's desire is to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. And this is our prayer, lifted through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is one that should be familiar to all of you. It's the parable of the talents, only in the New International Version, which is in your pew and which you will see. It's not talents, it's bags of gold. Now, one of the things they invite you to do when you read Scripture to make it more meaningful and to help it come alive is for you to imagine yourself in the scene as one of the individuals there being spoken of. So what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to get you to help me with the Scripture reading. When it comes to the part where the person who is given the five bags of gold responds, it'll be in yellow. I'm going to get this group. You're going to be the one with the five bags of gold. When we get to the point where the two, the one with the two bags of gold, you'll read that part. It'll be in yellow. I'll point to you. Guess which part you get. Boy, are you excited. Now, the reason I'm picking this section, it's the longest one to read, and I've got Paul and Patricia, and I know they will. They will actually read it. It's not any reflection on your character. It's just, <laughs> just, just want to say. So it's uh, verses 14 through 30, so I invite you to listen. Listen for the word of God to you. Jesus said again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth 
to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five and said, His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, how did you feel if Jesus said that to you? Would it make you just kind of go, that is wonderful? Or your employer who praises you for doing an exceptional job. How does that make you feel? Okay. The man with two bags of gold came. And this is what he said. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. How did you feel? Okay, saying it to you again. Okay, this is really a good thing. Goes downhill from there. <laughs> the man who had received one bag of gold came. Read this one. Sorry, read it. And the master should be happy, right? I mean, he is getting back what he had gotten. So everything should be, y'all did a good job, right? His master replied, oh my, is this a surprise? You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. How do you feel so far? Did you feel like the other two groups? No. Well, it gets worse. <laughs> so take the bag of gold from them and give it to the, to the one who has ten bags. For whoever, yeah, y'all are coming out on top of this one. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have an, even what they have will be taken from them. Yeah, it gets worse. And throw, this is the part I really don't like. Seriously, really don't like. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, how do you feel about that? And I think... Jesus is given to hyperbole. I think he's exaggerating to make a point. But I think when we don't use that which God gives us, that's where we end up. That we're out in the darkness weeping and wailing and gnashing of our teeth. And hopefully when we get into the sermon, I won't directly mention that, but you'll understand what I mean. But this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us once again approach God in prayer. And as we do, I'll remind you of the prayer concern printed on the back of the bulletin. Uh, there are two uh, that are in bold, I will mention, and two that you do not have. Uh, Teresa McKendrick is going to have her surgery, her back surgery, on the 20th. That's Wednesday. So lift her up in prayer, and she is looking forward to it. It should just make everything much, much better. Bone spur, and they're going to fix it. And Rick Peel, um, 
Pam Leckie's niece's father uh, passed away on October the 11th, so continue to lift up that family in your thoughts and your prayers. And Sam Early is going to have back surgery on November the 3rd, so remember him. I think his is a little more involved uh, than Teresa's will be, but we will remember Sam. And Sam Curtis, who is a friend of uh, Paul and Blake Shelton, uh, was diagnosed with COVID and is in quarantine uh, in the house. And he's married and has two kids, two children. Uh, so please lift and, and pray that nobody else gets it. I don't think the others uh, have been vaccinated. The children haven't. So please lift that family up in your thoughts and your prayers. If there's anyone that you would like to let us know about, you're invited to say their name out loud as we first go to God silently in prayer. And then I will lead in the pastoral prayer. Let us go to God. Disturb us, Lord, <clears throat> when we're too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dream too little, and when we arrive safely because we sail too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life, when we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery. We're losing sight of land. We shall find stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push us into the future in strength, courage, hope and love. This is our prayer through the one who gives us a future and a hope, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
didn't enough. That was really nice. The question this morning is, how many of you want to wreck your life? Raise your hand if you want to wreck your life. Nobody's raising their hand. Well, if perhaps secretly deep down inside you really want to wreck your life, I'm glad you came today because I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you my opinion on how you can do that. Actually, I'll give you several opinions <laughs> on how you can do that. Uh, I used to give a leadership presentation called uh, The Seven Essential Ingredients for Success. And if I can remember them, it's been a long time since I've done this leadership presentation. Those seven essential elements for success are vision, strategy, passion, people, flexibility, prayer, and get started. So if you want to wreck your life, don't do any of those things. Have no vision, no plan for your life. If you have a plan for your life, don't have a strategy for accomplishing that plan. And even if you do have a strategy for accomplishing that plan, don't get excited about it. So you'll kind of give up as you go along. Don't invite other people to help you succeed. Try to do everything on your own. Be inflexible. The first time something goes wrong, and it will go wrong, quit. Just stop. Go, well, it's just not worth it. It just wasn't meant to be. And don't pray about it. Don't ask God to partner with you in what it is you're trying to accomplish. Or better yet, don't ask him to let you know if it's worth accomplishing or not. And whatever you do, you could have all the other ingredients up there. Don't start. If you never start, you'll never accomplish any of those things. When I was trying to find a graphic for how to wreck your life, I found this. How to wreck your life in 10 easy steps. And I liked it so much I put it right in here and you're going to get this one. Are you ready? Ready or not, here we go. Number one, settle for less. Don't do your best. Just whatever you can get by with. Procrastinate. Wait until conditions are absolutely perfect and you know there's no chance of failing. Never learn how to manage money. Don't forgive anyone. Care about what others think. Actually, I think you should. Uh, but it's the phrase, what other people think matters, but it shouldn't matter too much. I mean, it shouldn't push you over the edge or make you want to jump off a bridge or think less of yourself but I think you should kind of pay attention to what others think. Live a lie. I love this one because it was in all caps. Worry more. 
I got that one nailed. I've got that one handled. It will ruin your life completely. Just worry all the time. Ignore your health. Never say you're sorry. Complain about everything. No matter how good you got it, you can find something to complain about, can't you? Well, of course we can. Okay, how can you see the signs that you're about to wreck your life? I'm going to start with a word that I didn't know existed until I read a book by Stephen Covey called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families. And he said, entropy is the culprit. What does that mean? I'm going to read you <laughs> what he says that it means, because I think it's a good quote. But it's the central theme of the scripture reading. You don't use it, it's going to fall apart. Matthew 25, 8 but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So if you do that with your life, with your health, with your relationships, guess what's going to happen? Entropy. So let me share what Covey writes about it in his book. He said, in physics, entropy means that anything left to itself will eventually disintegrate until it reaches its most elemental form. The dictionary defines entropy as the steady degradation of a system or society. This happens in all of life, and we know it. Neglect your body, it will deteriorate. Neglect your car, it will deteriorate. Watch TV every available hour, and your mind will deteriorate. Anything that is not consciously attended to and renewed will break down, become disordered, and deteriorate. Use it or lose it is the maxim. Richard L. Evans puts it this way, all things need watching, working at, caring for, and marriage is no exception. Only kind of put in there in parentheses your spiritual life, your relationships, your job, your health. Whoop. Marriage is not something to be treated indifferently or abused or something that simply takes care of itself. Nothing neglected will remain as it was or is or will fail to deteriorate. All things need attention, care, and concern, and especially so in this most sensitive of all relationships of life. So also with regard to the family culture, it requires constant deposits into the emotional bank account just to keep it where it is now. So that is, I believe, the culprit. What are you doing with that which God has given to you? And what is that quote that we all know Life is God's gift to us. What we do with life is our gift to God. What are we doing with the life, the time, gifts, talents, people, relationships, spiritual condition, church, that we have been given? How well are we managing it? What are the warning signs that we're slipping into wrecking our life or any aspect of those things that I just mentioned? I'm going to give you a visual from Proverbs 27, 33 through 34. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. What's your flock? What's your herd? Your life. Everything I just mentioned. Time, talent, treasure, relationships. That's your herd. Be sure you know the condition of everything you have. For riches do not endure forever. And a crown is not secure for all generations. It's not going to last forever if you're not paying attention to it. So pay attention to that which has been given to you. In the warning signs, he also mentions this. What are the warning signs? Unresolved tension in key relationships. Not having time for celebration. You don't celebrate anything. You don't celebrate any special occasions with any meaning. A loss of gratitude. Are you grateful for that which you have or always complaining about what you don't have? Arguing over trivial matters. In relationships, in a church, in a business. If you're arguing over things that don't really matter, that is a big red flag that things are not going well. And you're headed to wrecking whatever it is, whatever area you're in at the time. What are the consequences? Another visual image from Proverbs 24, 30, 31. I went past the field of a sluggard, somebody who doesn't do anything with what he has, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Okay, you got it? Thorns had come up everywhere. 
The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. Doesn't that give you a wonderful image of what's going to happen in all those areas of your life if you don't pay attention to them? If you're not doing those things you need to do in order for them not just to survive but to thrive, and I'll give you a quote on that in a little bit. What's the answer? This is one. (laughs) Bloom where you're planted. And when I was looking for images for bloom where you're planted, I found this one. I love this one. Okay, you may not have much, but what do you have? And one of the problems that a lot of us have, we keep going, well, if I just had, I wish I had their money, their house, their relationships, their spouse, whatever, that you're never really grateful for what you have and you don't try to do anything with what you have. Live in reality. What is it that you do have? Now that you have this, what are you planning on doing with it? Instead of, I wish I had something more. We've got two wise workers and one, sadly, over here, that was not so wise. Two really good ones over here just remind you of what they read. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who had two bags of gold gained two more. And we know what? The other one did with his, hers, theirs. But the person who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Let me give you a visual image of this. Do you remember at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine, and what? And does them. Remember, he had just preached a whole sermon. There are a whole bunch of things, and it's a wonderful, wonderful sermon. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them in practice will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains came down, and the streams rose, and the wind blew against that house, but it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. And it said, But then what was the other half to that story? But there was a foolish man who built his house on what? Paula's sand. And boy, those were gorgeous pictures. But what if you want, was that castle going to stand? And when the rains come down and the streams rose and the winds blow against that beautiful sand castle? No, it'll fall. And great was the fall of it. What is the foundation of your life. Let me share something using that as a catalyst or a thought where, and this is an Ordberg quote, everybody builds a house, both the wise man and the fool, each little piggy, and everybody faces a storm. The wolf knocks at every door. The question is, what are you going to build your life on, rock or sand? With what materials, brick or straw? What's the foundation? In what are you placing your ultimate trust? No one sets out to build on sand. No architect says, here's a sandy spot. A good storm will wash a house completely away on this spot. Let's build here. Life is this way. No one sits down and plans on having a mediocre existence. No couple pledges their troth aiming at getting a divorce someday. Nobody nurses a grudge in hopes of becoming a bitter, resentful person. People don't give birth to children intending to be so busy that their kids won't know them. No one sits down and plans on his life going to hell. It just happens. And that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Hell. And he's not talking about eternal hell. It's talking about a living hell. And I think maybe just about everybody in here has been there. And if you haven't, you don't want to go. But if you continue to do those things that will wreck your life, I guarantee you you're going to be in that darkness where people weep and wail and gnash their teeth. And it is called a living hell. What is the foundation upon which you're building your life? Who do you trust? Who are you placing your faith in? Now, one of the problems that we don't get around to doing all of those things we want to do is a word with which we're all familiar, procrastination. What does that mean? Yeah, 
Proverbs 6, another visual image, 9 through 11. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? <laughs> How, this is Bible, by the way. I'm not saying this to you, just, just so you know. When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Guess what happens? And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. You need to pay attention to what you are doing. Now, we all know in this procrastination, and we, I, I don't know, maybe you don't do this. I'm going to go on a diet. When? Monday. I want to get the weekend over with. I'm just going to pig out over the weekend. I'm going to get my finances in order. When? Next month. This month is not really a good time to start. I'm going to get rid of that bad habit. When? Tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. There is a story. It's an old story about a man who moved back to his hometown. He had moved away 20 years ago. And he went to the house where he had grown up. And he went up and he asked the person who lived there if he could just, you know, for sentimental, nostalgic purposes, would you mind if I just walked through the house? He said, no, come on in. He's a nice guy. And so he found in the attic an old leather jacket. It used to be his favorite jacket when he was in high school. He put it on and he reached in his pocket and pulled out a repair slip from a shoe shop. And so just on a whim, he decided to see if that shoe shop had been 20 years was still there. And it was. And the guy who operated it 20 years ago was still the same guy who operated it today. So he handed him that repair slip and said, are my shoes ready? And he said, wait a second, I'll find out. He goes into the back. A few minutes later, he comes out and he says, yeah, you'll be ready Thursday. <laughs> it had been 20 years yeah, which we'll get to another point I'm going to make in just a little bit. But one of the problems we have, we have selective entropy. We are busy doing a lot of things, but are we busy doing the right things? There is this wonderful quote, and it comes out of a John Maxwell book quoting Peter Drucker, and they're both leadership gurus, and talks about the difference between efficiency and effectiveness efficiency is doing things right effectiveness is doing right things and maxwell's comment on this is efficiency is foundational for survival effectiveness is foundational for success and what is wonderful you can be doing your job really really well you can be great at it but are you doing the right things? Yeah, you may be surviving in your business, in your marriage, may be surviving. But are you effective? Do you know your spouse's, here's one that popped in my mind. Do you know your spouse's love language so that you can speak it so they understand when you're trying to let them know that you do, in fact, love them? Do you try to do that? A man may have this tremendously successful career. He is doing everything right in his job, but he is losing his children. They don't really know him anymore. He is very efficient at his job, but not with his family. A woman is wonderful about taking all of the kids everywhere they need to go, soccer practice, scouts, track, all of that stuff, but her spiritual life, is just shriveling up inside. She's not paying any attention to it. A married couple on the outside, they seem to have everything going for them. Nice jobs, both of them, nice house, nice kids. But they haven't had a meaningful conversation in months, maybe years. And it is a matter, yes, you need to be efficient at what you're doing, but effective. Are you doing the right thing? things are you paying attention to what you need to pay attention to and the word for this is that we all use balance is your life in balance are you efficiently effective at enabling all your relationships not just to survive but to soar to thrive to really do well at the very beginning of covey's book what he says is tell me the top three things that matter the most to you list them now are they getting the time care and attention that they need 
And then the whole book kind of centers around how you can do that. So, are you? So what are the lessons? I'm getting really close to being on time. I'm pretty excited because uh, that rarely happens. I'm <clears throat> becoming self-motivated. Another visual image for this, Proverbs 6, 6, and 8, go to the ant. Have you ever thought of the ant as a role model? That, that's never on the top of my list. You sluggard. I don't like to think of myself that either. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So become self-motivated. Don't wait for somebody to push you in the right direction or to force you to do those things you need to do. Don't wait until your marriage is just falling apart before you decide to do something with it. And you need to do something with it before you see a counselor because as most of them will tell you, by the time you get to that point, it's probably too late. You need to see the warning signs prior to that time. Now, very often they can help salvage it. But it's also true with your spiritual life. Are you aware of how far you're drifting away? Remember I put that phrase, if I can remember it, because it just popped into my mind. Uh, that phrase about... We close the door in God's face a thousand times a day and then we wonder why it doesn't seem closer to us. In those moments when life is falling apart, we go to God and we wonder why he's not there. He's there. We've just forgotten how to communicate with him. We just keep shutting the door in his face. We're just not going to pay attention until finally he just can't get through. And we are the problem. Become self-motivated to open yourself up to the things that you really need to do. Discover the power of personal renewal. And this is a quote from Covey's book. It said, in a family, any renewal activity done together builds relationships as well. For example, family members who exercise together not only build their individual physical strength and endurance, they also increase bonding through that activity. Family members who read together multiply both learning and bonding through discussing, synergizing, and piggybacking ideas. Family members who worship and serve together strengthen one another's faith as well as their own. They become more unified and connected as they join together in a sacred expression of things that are important to them all. So understand the power of personal renewal and how it connects or should connect in every part of your life and understand the law of opportunity and simply stated this is your vineyard this is your herd this is your life life is God's gift to you what you do with it is your gift to God this is your your gifts your talents your abilities your health your relationship your spiritual relationship with God and if you can, remember those seven steps, vision, strategy, passion, flexibility, people, prayer. But the most important is what? Get started. When are you going to get started? Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. When do you start? Start today. What do you need to do today, right now, at this moment, to start the journey to become the person God wants you to be, whatever it is, start today and hear Jesus say, read this with me, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Let us pray. Most merciful and gracious God, help us to to take care of our vineyard, our gifts, talents, treasure, health, relationships, but especially our relationship with you. You are the vine. We are the branches. Apart from you, we can do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. May we start today and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Enter into the joy of your master. This is our prayer, lifted through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to invite you now to affirm your faith with me by reading in unison the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand as, as we affirm our faith together? Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I do extend the invitation to you to think about this week, how you can bloom where you're planted, what you need to do beginning today to strengthen all of those areas of your life. And the first way to do that is do a self-evaluation. What are you good at? What are your strengths? And then think about where are your weaknesses? Okay, leave the strengths alone this week. Just concentrate on those areas in which you're weak and try to strengthen those areas. And before you do that, go to God in prayer and ask him to lead you in that area where you need to work the most. I also extend the invitation, as I do every Sunday, if there's anyone here who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, and if you have felt the movement of God's Spirit, if you would like to profess your faith publicly, and you can do it privately, I'd like to talk to you. But if you would like to do that, uh, you may do that as we sing, Take My Life and Let It Be. Now may God's love give you confidence and his truth give you direction. May God's eternalness give you peace and hope this day and all your days. Amen.